Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Since 1990, the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii has been following our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education as we've grown to become one of the largest all-volunteer nonprofit vegetarian societies in the nation. It is now time to introduce our special guest. We're very happy to have with us tonight Terry Shantani, MD. Terry Shen, yay. <laughs> yay. Terry Shantani, MD, JD, MPH, received his master's degree in nutrition at Harvard University and medical and law degrees at the University of Hawaii. Board certified in preventive medicine, he serves as professor and associate chair of the Department of Complementary and Alternative Medicine at the John A. Burns School of Medicine. He's chair of the International Holistic Therapy Association, chair of the advisory board of the Gandhi International Institute of Peace, and member of the Council of Elders of Native Hawaiian Healers. He is best known for his promotion of health in the Hawaiian community and for his whole person health programs, one of which won the highest national award from the United States Secretary of Health. He has written 17 books, including the Eat More, Way Less Diet, the Hawaii Diet, and the Peace Diet. His two most recent books, which just came out a few weeks ago, are Chocolates for the Spirit, 101 Delicious Inspirational Quotes to Elevate the Spirit, and Peace Diet, cookbook, over 100 recipes compatible with the Peace Diet for weight loss, health, and longevity. He has been featured in Newsweek, on CBS This Morning, ABC National Radio, CNN News, and Dateline NBC, and in 1995, the Encyclopedia Britannica. For his contributions to humanity, he has been designated a living treasure of Hawaii and knighted by the Order of St. John of Jerusalem, the oldest Christian healing order in the world. His presentation tonight is entitled, Diabetes, Pain, and Cancer, Get Your Health Back in 10 Days. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Terry Shantani. All right, thank you for that uh, very um, detailed introduction, a humbling introduction, but thank you very much. And I'm very pleased that you all decided to spend your evening with me, a very nice crowd tonight. If I don't cover what you're uh, interested in in my talk, just ask questions. I'll have time for questions at the end because, um, you know, I've been doing this for quite some time and the, the the information just keeps piling up and piling up and piling up and there's just not enough time in, in an hour to, uh, to provide you with all the uh, information that I have. So uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, um, every so often I put on 10-day health programs and I try to implement uh, what I'm teaching here and when people participate in the program, a lot of people are able to uh, get off of their medication. Um, I, as you know, I'm a professor of medicine at the med school and I teach fourth year students. And I had two students today and I said, uh, I, I told them, you know, one of the things I teach is how to get people off their medication. Most of their education is how to put them on medication. But I asked them a question. Uh, didn't you come to medical school to be a healer? And of course they said yes, right? So how much of a healer are you if you put them on medication and you can't get them off? And of course they have a little bit of a, uh, a little bit embarrassed look. And I said, how many of you were taught how to get people off their medication? And of course none of them could say they were taught that way. So that's what I try to teach. I try to pe teach people how to get off medication, because after all, 
if you're still on medication, that means you're still sick, right? So what kind of a healer are you if you leave them on medication and they're on it for the rest of their life? So that's what uh, I'm all about. Uh, tonight's topic is get your health back in 10 days, anti-diabetes, cancer, and chronic disease. And part of the reason I'm talking about these things is because a lot of this is coming together. There's actually a common factor, several common factors in diabetes, cancer, and chronic pain, and we'll, we're gonna cover that uh, tonight. One of, one of the approaches that I like to use is a whole person uh, approach, because part of the reason I do this is I, along with some of my colleagues, believed our healthcare system is broken. How many of you would agree our health system is broken? Well, it should be everybody, because think about it. If our health system was working, shouldn't healthcare be, costs be going down, right? Do, do you know what I'm saying? If the health system was working, you would be healthier. If you're healthier, you need less medicine, less doctor visits, less surgeries and hospitalization, and costs should be going down. And then we'd have enough to take care of the aged, blind, disabled, and those who can't afford to cover their own health, right? But instead, you all know which way it's going. It's going the other direction. So clearly, our health, health system is broken. So uh, I started a foundation, actually about 20 years ago, um, with members of the Hawaiian community. Um, Kenny Brown, who was chair of Queens at the time, and Ho'i Puti Campbell, who was chair of the Waianae Center where I used to work. And we decided that a whole person, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual approach would be better. How many would agree with that? There you go. Virtually all hands w went up. So if you believe in that, then you won't mind me acknowledging the spiritual side of things by allowing me to say a prayer at the beginning. So if you don't mind, let us bow our heads. E kako, let us pray. Maka ino no o kamaku meke keiki. Meka uhane hemolele. Mahalo ne mako yaoe. No ko malama ya ene kamako o lakino. E ho o mahala mai kamako halavai. Meka na au au mai kalani. A meka ho opu mai kai. Our gracious heavenly Father, blessed be thy name. We thank you for this life you have given us and for looking after our health. Humbly, we ask now that you bless this gathering. Allow us all to learn the glory of thy healing and allow us to be healed in body, mind, and spirit so that we may serve thee better. Those things we pray, no kamea, no kiapuni meka mana, meka ho'onani ia amalo atu. Amen and amen. And thank you for allowing me to do that. So tonight we're talking about getting your health back. And I'm gonna talk about how diabetes, cancer, and chronic disease are actually all connected to each other and what to do about it. So how many of you would like to learn how to control blood sugar while eating more carbohydrates? How many of you would like to learn how to control cholesterol and blood pressure with less medicine? How many of you just wanna learn how to eat twice as much and still lose weight? <laughs> <laughs> so we know where you're coming from, so I'm going to talk about all of those topics. Uh, and believe it or not, I'm going to show you how to eat twice as much and still lose weight. Um, I'm declaring my affiliations, I think we had mentioned this, I'm with the University of Hawaii International Holistic Therapy Association, American College of Lifestyle Medicine, Gandhi Institute of Peace, and Council of Elders, Native Hawaiian Healers. So, it's the New Year's, and what do you suppose is the most popular New Year's resolution? Lose weight. Well, get healthy includes lose weight, and it's always number one, always. I mean, I've been watching this for the last 20 years, and number one is always lose weight, get healthy. The next one is get organized, take up a new ho hobby, save more, spend less, etc. 
Interestingly, stop smoking and stop drinking is actually dropping down the list. I'm not sure why, but <laughs> main thing is getting healthy. So that's what I'm going to help you with. So the reason um, my talk today is important, by the way, how many of you are seeing me speak for the first time tonight? So that's probably more than half. And how many of you have seen me speak before? I know a lot of you have. Okay, so probably about 60, 40. Well, those of you who have seen me speak before, you'll realize this is starting to change because I try to keep up with the times. Well, this is the 10 leading causes of death in the US some years ago. What, what I think everyone should realize is heart disease is rapidly no longer becoming the number one cause of death. Cancer is just about to overtake heart disease now. And what's scary about it is how prevalent cancer is these days. But cancer is now rapidly becoming number one. Actually, in Hawaii, it's already number one. It's not heart disease anymore. And the scary thing is one out of two men and one out of three women will now get cancer, according to today's statistics. That is one out of 2.5 people. In the old days, it used to be one out of 21, back in 1971. Today, look how much it's come. And there are some common factors which we're gonna talk about, and when we talk about that, we'll give you some ideas on how not to become this statistic. Now, part of the reason this is important to me is um, I became a doctor probably because my father had cancer when I was six months old. And I know what it's like to have cancer in my family. Uh, this is back in the, I was born in 1951. My dad had a permanent colostomy, took out the left side of his colon from colon cancer uh, when I was six months old. By three years old, I knew me what metastases were and I was very, very scared. The Lord was good to us Dad never died of cancer, but it leaves a bad taste in your mouth when you have to worry your whole life whether your dad's gonna be gone. And to see these numbers get so high is very, very disconcerting to me. The other problem is diabetes is becoming an epidemic. Several, uh, about 10 years ago, the number of people with diabetes was around 8% and pre-diabetics was about somewhere around 15%, totaled up to a little over 20%. Now it's half of America is, has abnormal blood sugar. It's staggering, it's scary. And of course, a lot of people now have chronic pain and chronic conditions. So what's in common with all of these things? Well, it's very interesting. What's in common are these factors. Obesity, insulin, inflammation, and there's a new term coming around, dysbiosis. Do you all know what that means? Well, here's a clue. Obesity is related to all these diseases. It's not a surprise, right? Because when you're overweight, your cholesterol goes up, you can't control blood sugar, and so forth. Insulin is related to what they call metabolic syndrome. That includes diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, but now we know it's related to cancer and many other conditions. Inflammation is related to all of these diseases, cancer, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, pulmonary arthritis, autoimmune, and so forth. But here's the really strange thing. Relatively new research says that antibiotic exposure raises the risk of cancer of the breast. All right, how many of you find this surprising? Antibiotic use. The more people are exposed to antibiotics, the higher their risk of breast cancer. Well, you're thinking, how can that be? Because antibiotics work with infectious diseases and breast cancer is not an infectious disease. What they're finding is that your gut flora is protecting you from cancer. 
And when you take antibiotics, you kill your gut flora, and the gut flora no longer performs its de detox, and your body gets exposed to higher levels of toxins, and you increase your risk of cancer. Well, it's a new year, so we need a new approach. Um, this is my, one of my latest books, The Peace Diet, and we have a whole person approach. And when we use this kind of approach, we have a great deal of success. Because obesity is, so, is related to so many of these conditions, um, wouldn't you like to find out why eating may, more may be better for weight loss, right? How many of you have heard that eating more might be better for weight loss? A few of you have. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, they're always telling you to eat. How many of you would like to eat less to lose weight? How many of you would rather eat more to lose weight? Sure you would, right? Well, this is my, one of my patients. He started out at 500 pounds. I got him off insulin. Uh, it took probably about six months to get him off insulin. But what was more important, I got him off of about 15 other medications. So how do we do that? Well, we put him on a program and got him to eat more food. What do I mean by that? Well, how many of you want to know how to eat twice as much and still lose weight? Well, I'm going to show you. Poi, brown rice, sugar, and fat. What is similar? Somebody said calories. That's correct, 200, 200, 200, 200 calories. Did it ever occur to you that 200 calories was so little food? You see, when you eat lots of sugar, white flour, and oil, you eat very little. In fact, you eat less, but you weigh more. You understand what I'm saying? So let's show, let's see what this means in terms of real food. This is a typical American lunch. Burger, fries, and a drink. How many of you could eat that in one sitting? I'm not saying if you do eat it, I'm saying if you could. And I could, I don't, but I could, right? How many of you would still be hungry after eating that? Yeah, I would. How many of you could eat this in one sitting? Careful, that's four pounds of food. How many of you can eat four pounds of anything in one sitting? Well, I always have one or two wise guys saying that they could, but you'd have to admit that if you eat this, it'll take you longer, right? And you would feel more full, wouldn't you, right? So what is similar about this plate and this plate? Same number of calories, very, very smart. But if you said same calories, you would be wrong. This is about 1,200 calories. This is about 1,100. But this is about three times as much food. I just kept on eating and eating, and I was never hungry. I've never, never felt deprived. I eat a lot of food. <laughs> My original weight loss was 45 pounds, 37 pounds so far. I've lost 52 pounds. I've lost 56 pounds, and I've kept it off for seven years. One of the issues that a lot of, remember how we talked about obesity being one of the big uh, issues that connect diabetes, cancer, and chronic pain? Another issue is insulin. Do you know why insulin is important? You notice Mary Tyler Moore has been slim her whole life. Do you know why? She doesn't make insulin. She's type 1 diabetic. Do you know why he's so large, 500 pounds? Type 2 diabetes. You know what's wrong with type 2 diabetes? They have too much insulin, but it doesn't work well. Because it doesn't work well, the pancreas keeps pouring out insulin. And you know what insulin does? It makes you fat. You know what else insulin does? It makes tumors grow. You know what else insulin does? It raises inflammation. Do you see how this is all connected? So you need to control insulin by controlling blood sugar, 
but how many of you would like to eat, do it by con eating more carbs than less carbs? Do you know what I'm talking about? How many of you have heard you should eat less carbs because your blood sugar is going high, right? How many of you say, have heard that you should eat less carbs to prevent diabetes, right? Next time somebody tells you that, ask them, why is it then that the countries that eat the most carbs have the least amount of diabetes? Do you know what I'm saying? In Japan, they eat lots of carbs, more than we do here, and they have one-third the diabetes rate. They come here, they eat less carb, 300% rise in diabetes. They move to the mainland, 400% rise in diabetes. Tell me why eating less carb is a good idea. And if you, tell, if you ask them that, they won't have an answer for you. The problem is they don't understand carbohydrates are very different if you process them. You see, here's Japan, high carb, low diabetes rate. Hawaii, 300% rise. Washington State, 400% rise. How soon after you began the Hawaiian diet did you stop taking insulin altogether? It was my second week on the diet. You're kidding. No, it was. Two weeks two, out. Two weeks on the diet. We've done that with even uh, worse cases, with people who had even more insulin. Dr. Shintani published the results of his diet in the respected American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. In his study, the average dieter lost 17 pounds. Cholesterol counts dropped 14%. Blood pressure and blood sugar improved as well, all in just three weeks. And what's not said there is this is a high carbohydrate diet. It's a 75% carbohydrate diet. In my programs, you can see just about everybody's blood sugars drop, except this, this person, we had to stop his insulin, and he bounced up a little bit. I never went away from the meal feeling hungry or deprived. And that was one of the problems that I've had with diets in the past. I always had to eat a lot less food, and I always seemed to be hungry but not on Dr. Shintani's diet. When I first started this thing, my cholesterol level was about 235, something like that. And it went down 100 points in three weeks. So if you can lower your cholesterol in by 100 points in three weeks, why would you want to take a statin drug? How many of you know somebody on a statin cholesterol medicine? Do you know what the problem with statins are? It causes memory loss. It causes muscle damage, muscle weakness. And you know what's the scary thing? Now they find out it causes diabetes. It's crazy. It's better to control cholesterol naturally. Um, this is 10 day, on my 10 day program, you can see everybody's cholesterol drops. Some of them, this is about 70 point drop. Each of these bars is 50 points. This person drops 70 points in 10 days. Uh, we show, we have, Actually, uh, we demonstrated a drop in um, high blood pressure, of course, controlling cholesterol, blood sugar, sodium. By the way, high sugar rises, raises insulin. Insulin contributes to high blood pressure. That's why it's important. Of course, sodium, stress, smoking, exercise. Nitric oxide is now being uh, known to be important. Where do you get nitric oxide? Uh, well, nitric oxide is important because, you know, you ever see somebody who has um, chest pain? They have these tiny little pills, nitroglycerin. Well, it's, you put it under your tongue and it produces nitric oxide. Well, you can do that naturally by eating vegetables and beets happens to be pretty good. So you see here all these beet drinks now uh, as being so good for you. But actually, um, a lot of the vegetable, most of the vegetables have high uh, uh, nitrates to produce nitric oxide. This is systolic pressure. You can see everybody's pressure dropping in my program. Um, controlling uh, autoimmune, uh, chronic pain, cancer, autoimmune disease. Like I said, what's in common? Well, inflammation, obesity, insulin. Inflammation is associated with all of these diseases. What, how do you contribute to inflammation? Well, obesity and insulin are two of the pieces. They're kind of all related. But omega-6 fats have a lot to do with it, arachidonic acid, which most people don't know uh, anything about. And now they're finding 
Of course, processed carbs are not good for you. But look at this, microbiome dysbiosis. You know what that means? Microbiome is your gut flora. They don't call it flora anymore because there's a lot more than flora in your gut. There's viruses, there's parasites, there's fungi, and the, all of these things have good and bad effects, so they call it microbiome, so it includes everything in your gut. Dysbiosis meaning something has gone wrong because when you eat properly, you have a healthy microbiome. You know, that's why uh, eating properly is so important. I uh, used to think that um, my program lowered blood sugar mainly because when you eat lots of fiber, you slow down the absorption of sugar. I mean, that's part of it, but now they're finding that a lot of the effect of a good diet is that you, f you feed the bacteria properly. See, now, you're, now you realize you're not eating just for you. You're eating for your microbiome. And that's kind of a brand new concept. And the, and the interesting thing is they say, well, <laughs> there's actually 10 times more cells in your gut than you have in your whole, your whole body. So you're actually feeding a little ecosystem in your gut. And when you don't feed it right, uh, you have problems. Let me just give you an example. When you eat a piece of meat, and if you don't eat much fiber with it, what happens? You get constipated, right? Think about what happens to meat at body temperature if it stays in there for two or three days and you don't have a bowel movement. Just think about that. What is meat like at body, not room temperature, no, body temperature for three days? What's that gonna smell like? It gives you an idea of what's inside your gut. Um, pathways to inflammation, this is actually very complicated, but let me just say that um, one of the worst things for inflammation is chicken. Chicken's one of the worst foods for inflammation. And a lot of the oils are quite bad for inflammation. Now, when I put people on my program, we actually correct the imbalances in the oils and the fiber. And I have to assume that the dysbiosis is gone because just about everybody gets well in my program. Please don't throw cigarettes on the floor. Cockroaches are getting cancer. <laughs> Meanwhile, these are the doctor's endorsements of Lucky Strikes. Amazing. This is a smoke-free environment, and they're still doing that. But one out of 2.5 people in America will get cancer. It's a stunning statistic. If you don't have cancer, you might as well learn this stuff because you got a 40% chance of getting cancer. It's a crazy number. 1971, one out of 21. Nine, 2000 and, what is that, 2001? Actually, it's probably higher now because that was the data that we had back then. It's um, 40%. Well, this is cancer. This is the Seralini study. You can see gen genetically modified rat with Roundup. So much for the statement that it doesn't cause cancer. It does, we know. If you, ever, if you ever hear a study that's saying um, that the GMOs with Roundup are safe, just look at this study. Um, the reason they say it was safe is because their original tests were 90 days. You know, what, you know how ridiculous that is? It's like saying, okay, here's a pack of cigarettes, smoke them for 90 days. What, no cancer? See, cigarettes don't cause cancer. It's absolute nonsense. And here's that study showing that higher exposure to antibiotics increased the risk of cancer almost 100, uh, breast cancer, almost twofold. Now, why am I showing this? Because you see, Roundup is not only an herbicide. You know, y'all know what Roundup is? It's a weed killer. I bet you didn't know that it was first patented as an antibiotic. Okay, it was first patented as an antibiotic, but they realized that plants use the same biological mechanism to survive that was interrupted by this as the bacteria, and they realized it would kill plants too. You know what's the problem with this? Whenever you take a 
Roundup laden food like GMO soy or uh, even most wheat products. You know, you know what they do for, to wheat now huh? to harvest it? They douse the ripe grain plant with Roundup, even though it's not genetically modified. They're actually killing the plant. They're not killing the weeds, they're killing the wheat plant. So the grains are, are saturated with Roundup. And the reason they do it, they call it a drying agent to kill all the leaves so it's easier to harvest. The problem with that is now the people have to deal with the Roundup residues in their food, which is why I like to eat organic foods so that you don't have that kind of thing. Cumulative, cumulative days of antibiotic use, you can see a rise in breast cancer risk. And that's partly because your microbiome has many functions, including detoxification. And when you kill your gut flora with antibiotics, you're probably uh, preventing your gut bacteria from detoxifying some of the things that you're consuming. And now those toxins get into your body unchanged and it can wreak havoc on your system. But there are many steps to controlling cancer. Um, I, I, I'm actually in the process of writing a book called Stairway to Cancer. And the reason I call it Stairway is because at each step, there's something you can do to prevent the cancer from growing. I mean, clearly diet has an effect on different kinds of cancer, high fat consumption, high breast cancer rates, not necessarily the fat, but something that these developed countries are doing increases the risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer. And protein is associated with high risk of breast cancer. And obesity is associated with all of these cancers. And uh, in terms of dealing with cancer, you see, once you have cancer, it's not the end of the road, you see, what I try to explain to people with cancer is this, everybody's got cancer. Everybody in this room has cancer, including me. The difference is your body handles it and deals with it. And those people who have the expression of cancer as tumors, something's gone wrong with the control mechanism. Let me explain. Cancer starts with DNA damage, okay? Of course, you wanna avoid DNA damage by avoiding chemicals and toxins and dioxins and radiation and smoking and all of these toxic things. And, but actually, your body's supposed to repair itself. I mean, your cells. But if your cell doesn't repair itself, then what happens, it goes into what they call dysplasia. And when it's this abnormal cell, if the cell is abnormal, it's supposed to kill itself in a process known as apoptosis. If this doesn't work, then it's what they call malignant transformation. It's a cancer cell, a frank cancer cell. Once it's a real cancer cell, your white blood cells are supposed to kill it. Your natural killer cells, your cytotoxic T cells, and your T helper cells are supposed to gang up on them and kill them off. And that's what's happening in most people. However, when those factors don't, uh, when those mechanisms don't work, then they start growing. But even when it starts growing, that's not the end of the line. You can actually help control the cancer by controlling insulin, IGF-1, hormones, inflammation, and some of these other factors, blood vessel production, uh, they call it angiogenesis. And there are things you can do at every step along the way. So that's what I try to do for cancer patients. I don't just say, oh, uh, we just gotta do chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery. I think the way cancer patients ought to be treated is you boost their own ability to fight it off, and then they can just live with the cancer. And you know something? I, I've had patients live so long with cancer that they die of something else. And if they die of something else, what difference did the cancer make, right? I just ate six happy meals and I'm still depressed. <laughs> well, calling, you know, labeling something happy does not necessarily make it happy. One of the interesting things is gut dysbiosis actually can cause 
not only inflammation, but depression. Now they're saying that it might affect the mood. So that's why these things are important. So in the next, this is um, um, a video of my program, and you'll see all kinds of things improving uh, when people have a good whole person diet and lifestyle. addicted to drugs and I mean prescription drugs and I mean it's like how damaging being addicted to a narcotic is to an individual this nation being addicted to prescription drugs is wrecking the nation I eat tums like to tap I ask for alternatives to pills and every time I go in I get another pill I'm gonna have to be taking it forever Every single day, a lot of lower back pain. I had night sweats. Extreme urinary frequency. I'm the only one. A lot. There's got to be something better than this. I have diabetes and all those things that kill Hawaiian. Uh, I believe it's going to be my last effort here. There are many people taking a lot of medicines that they could get rid of if they were following a good diet and lifestyle the way we recommend. <laughs> diet is dangerous. A diet makes people well so fast that their medication becomes dangerous. Oh. Yeah, skip it. I tell them to skip it because that's how I get them off. I have them to skip a dose, then skip two doses, and then I adjust them up. That's how I gradually take them off the medication. Actually, you should probably skip it. Skip it? Okay. This is so surprising. I can't yeah. believe it. Being that it's on the low side of normal, you probably don't need your diabetes medicine. slightly high, 107, yeah. now it's 90. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I had such a problem with reflux. Practically from the first day, it's been better. I have an unopened box of Prilosec. The stall was 228. Mm -hmm. And uh, after 21 days, it's 141. Off the dairy and off the meat products, nothing. Your headaches? Yeah, they're gone. Okay. I don't have any more headaches. <laughs> Don't you think that's the way medicine ought to be practiced, where we get people off their medicine instead of putting them on more and more? All right, I'm open for questions now. Is there any data on the effect of raw food on the microbiome? The answer is, I don't know, because you, you, you know, I was just at a conference. Uh, uh, last year I attended three world, con world congresses, uh, the World Congress of Qigong, the World Congress of 
Integrative Medicine and the World Congress of Anti-Aging Medicine. And this data is so new that maybe, maybe in a few months I'll have your answer. Uh, I suspect raw food is gonna be pretty good uh, for the microbiome. However, there are anti-nutrients on raw food, so I'm not sure how that plays uh, in terms of uh, gut flora. But I, I would, my, my, uh, my guess would be raw food is gonna be really good for the microbiome. And well, what's anti-nutrients? Think about a plant, right? You put an apple on a, on a table, and it doesn't go bad for a long time. It's because there are things in the apple that prevent it from being consumed by bacteria, et cetera. So when they're raw, when the food is raw, um, those, those, nutri those nutrients go into the gut intact. So it may have an effect. But you know, the thing is, nature, you know, I don't argue with mother nature. Nature made the foods in a certain way, so I suspect that you'll probably do fine eating raw foods. Uh, other nutrients, other anti-nutrients are like phytates. Phytic acid will prevent the absorption of certain minerals. Oxalic acid, if you have too many, too much oxalic acid, uh, you can't absorb calcium. So these are different anti-nutrients, and when you cook foods, some of these are destroyed and some nutrients are um, absorbed a little bit better. Uh, lectins, can, to some extent, are anti-nutrients. Those are little, those are components of, uh, of certain foods that uh, can have an anti-nutrient effect, yeah. The question, the question was, do they separate death from cancer or death from the treatment of cancer? And I suspect that they don't separate that out, yeah. Um, actually, I have a, a somebody who asked me something earlier. Um, complications of diabetes um, in relation to blood pressure, cholesterol, and especially uh, kidney disease and whether it's reversible or not. Well, as you may know, um, diabetes, the side effects of diabetes include um, uh, well, metabolic syndrome is kind of connected to it. Metabolic syndrome uh, occurs when you have very high insulin levels. Blood pressure goes up. Actually, insulin will clamp down blood vessels and raise blood pressure. It'll mess up your lipids. Your triglycerides will go up, uh, and it'll cause obesity. But one of the problems with diabetes is the high sugar will start to clog the tiny little capillaries in your body. Now, I think everybody knows that cholesterol will plug your big arteries, right? Everybody knows that. How many of you did not know that high sugar will plug your little capillaries? Right, isn't that, isn't that interesting that so many people don't know that? But you see, when you have chronically high blood sugar, the little capillaries in your toes get plugged up, that's why you, you can't, you stub your toe and it won't heal. That's why the capillaries in the back of your eyes start to have hemorrhages. That's why people start having memory loss. The little capillaries in their brain are starting to shut down. And that's why you go into kidney failure because kidneys are, are large tufts of capillaries where um, the body filters out uh, the um, toxins in your body. And when you have diabetes, one by one, those little capillaries in the kidneys shut down. And the question is, is it reversible? It's, I would say, mostly not reversible in, you know, in kidney disease. However, it can be arrested. I've had people with, uh, right on the verge of dialysis with uh, GFR levels GFR stands for glomerular filtration rates. When your number gets down to about 10, they put you on dialysis. I've had people at 11 or 12, I've had one guy on it for five years and never needed the dialysis. Um, so it can be arrested, but you have to eat very carefully um, and you have to control um, 
You have to control your diet very carefully. GMO foods and allergies. I know someone who gets a rash from GMO soy in the US and who goes to Japan and eats soy and there's no problem because in Japan there's no GMO soy. So I suspect um, there may well be allergies to genetically modified food. Is coconut oil in the Hawaiian diet? Um, coconuts are in the Hawaiian diet, but in general, um, uh, you can use very small amounts of it, but it's not a big part of the Hawaiian diet. Okay, yes, inflammation is a good thing around a wound. You know, it brings blood vessels, it causes healing, but when it goes too far, for example, when you have a plaque in your artery and inflammation starts to form around it, the plaque forms scar tissue and it gets bigger and bigger and then it may rupture and then you get a heart attack. You know, they find that if there's almost no inflammation, there's almost never a heart attack. So inflammation is important in that. Um, also, there's inflammation in Alzheimer's disease. The plaque formation in the brain is clearly related to scar formation due to an inflammatory process. Now they're finding Parkinson's disease. They find that there's inflammation in the substantia nigra that produces dopamine, and that inflammation starts to destroy the dopamine-producing cells, and then you get Parkinson's disease. And inflammation, of course, in your joints, you get arthritis, and you start to actually uh, damage the uh, cartilage in your joints. So, all of these factors, and then for autoimmune disease, um, your body overreacts to uh, some kind of initiating factor that looks like your own body and your body starts to attack itself. In general, there's no cholesterol in plants, if that's what you're asking. However, plant fats will raise cholesterol levels. So you can't just uh, avoid eating cholesterol and keep your cholesterol down. Uh, I have a lot of patients who are vegetarians and their cholesterol is high and they go, why is it that way? And almost always they're eating too many, uh, uh, too many vegetable oils. Even olive oil will raise cholesterol. Too many nuts. Nuts are typically 70 to 90 percent fat. Nut butters, these are all high fat. They're vegetarian, they're plant-based, but they will raise cholesterol. Well, the problem uh, I have with soy milk is, um, first of all, I think soy is a good food. A lot of people just demonize soy. Uh, I reviewed a book and he said soy is the, is the cause of diabetes and all. I said, no it isn't. I mean, the people who, who, are the, who live the longest in the world are the Okinawans, and they ate two to four ounces of soy per day in the form of miso or tofu. So how can you say it's bad food, you know? However, some people, I've had patients uh, who eat tofu, soybeans, then uh, textured vegetable protein made of soy, and then they'll drink soy milk. Now that's too much. And then you gotta start getting estrogenic effects and what they call goiterogenic effects. It'll actually start blocking the production of thyroid hormone. My plan, I try to get, um, I try to get people to get their nutrients from whole foods. But nobody's perfect, so if you're, and some of the foods actually are starting to uh, be short of minerals. So a little bit of supplementation I think is okay. Now if you've got cancer, then I might add some things that add inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, pro-apoptosis effects. But that's, that gets very complicated, yeah. So the, the five health foods that are <laughs> not healthy for you. Okay, actually there are many health foods that are not healthy for you. Number one, yogurt. Most people think yogurt's a health food. However, if you look at its insulinemic effect, it's higher than white rice, okay? Number two, chicken. I also already mentioned chicken. Too much arachidonic acid, okay? Uh, number three, Nut butters, too high in fat. Nuts are typically 70 to 90% fat. Probably too much. Number four, breakfast bars. You know, you see these Nature Valley breakfast bars? Very, very high in calorie density. 
and high in sugar. They may be low in fat, but fat's not, too much fat's not good, and also too much sugar is not good for you. Uh, and uh, a, a fifth, quote, health food is, <laughs> this, is this is funny, 2% milk. 2% milk is actually 35% fat. Who knew that 2% milk is 35% fat? Do you, you know, people say, but why do they call it 2% milk? And the answer is they're trying to mislead the public. It's 2% by weight. But nobody looks at calories by weight except the industry. So, so those are five. Actually, I, I actually have about 50 more yeah, healthy foods that are not healthy. Avocados, good in moderation because it's pretty high fat. Yeah, it's, it's quite high in fat, but it's pretty good fat. But you have to watch out. Any oil, including avocado oil, will raise cholesterol levels. If it's organic, it's not genetically modified and there are no pesticides on it, okay? I can't say the reverse. Yes, over there. So is the question, should we be asking for tests like C-reactive protein to check for inflammation? You know, I don't, I don't routinely ask for it because insurance doesn't like to pay for it. So I just change the diet and I get people's numbers down and uh, I know it's working because people tell me their joint pains are less, their headaches are gone, etc. Turmeric is great for inflammation. It's one of the best foods. So is astaxanthin. So is resveratrol. So, I mean, there are many really good anti-inflammatory uh, foods. Oh, the question is, I missed the part where you said when you eat twice as much carbs, but you lower your blood sugar, something like that. And, you, and I didn't mention what kind of carbs. Um, in 2002, I wrote a book called The Good Carbohydrate Revolution because everybody was getting it wrong. I mean, including the dietitians. And I know this because I teach dietitians. I, I actually teach dietetics classes. And uh, um, here's the thing. When people look at my program, blood sugar uniformly goes down. I published the results. You can look it up in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And yet, a similar study showed that Similarly high carb diet, blood sugar goes up. What's the difference? I never use processed carbs, okay? Because what people don't understand is when you eat carbs that are processed into a fine flour and turned into bread, it starts acting like sugar. You know, however, if you have a, you know, however, if you have a food like taro, right? Taro is 95% carbohydrate. How come Hawaiians were slim in the old days if carbs made you fat? And the answer is, it's not a processed carb. And blood sugar is actually controlled better when you eat carbs like that. So the key, one of the keys is, is um, unprocessed carbs. How do you know that you're digesting your food? Um, actually, no, it's actually a good question. Um, I have patients who come in and they feel bloated, but it's actually very simple. Actually, if you see food particles in your stool, you realize you're not completely digesting your food, and then I actually treat them with digestive enzymes. Yeah. But if you're not digesting your food, it's typically visible, and I've seen it. Oh, my 10-day program, in 10 days, we feed people 15 out of their 30 meals. We teach them how to make the other 15 so that they can sustain uh, a healthy diet and then I monitor them before and after. Um, it starts on a weekend. We, um, it's a whole day on Saturday. Uh, on Sunday, it's half a day. We teach people how to shop and what to substitute. And then they start preparing their own food and then we meet um, in the beginning, we meet every night for a couple of nights and then every other night, and then we just kind of wean people off. Uh, and then we check their blood at the end and people are, um, I, I actually get people to be impressed with themselves because can you imagine if you're doing this yourself, right? You're making half your meals 
and all of a sudden your cholesterol is 70 points less. Doesn't you, don't, wouldn't you feel empowered, right? Or suddenly, 10 days later, uh, you don't have to take insulin. You know, it's, it's inspiring to people when they do that. So that's what we do. We actually, I actually put my principles into practice. That's why I know that what I do uh, works. I, you know, I'm not just making a theory and reading somebody else's paper and, you know, I have my own patients and I see it, I, I see it all the time. Um, uh, including cancer, by the way. I have a couple of patients who are long-term stage four cancer survivors. Um, and partly, I mean, it doesn't ha it's not a guarantee, it doesn't happen for everybody, but I have a patient who's had stage four breast cancer, went to the liver, chemotherapy failed. Um, I, I put her on a regimen, diet and lifestyle, and it's now seven years later and she's still cancer free. All right, I wanna thank you all for um, your time. Um, Mahalo to all of you for coming and have a safe return home. Good night, everyone.